And welcome into the latest edition of the Kings Cast with uh, Jill Edge. I'm Damian Barling. We're thrilled that you're here with us on the Hoop Ball Podcast Network. We're thrilled for those that are watching here on twitch.tv slash ESPN 1320, the ESPN 1320 YouTube channel, or those who are watching along on Twitter at ESPN 1320. Well, it's not like they were going to win the last, you know, 30 games of the season or anything, but uh, just not much of a fight uh, against the San Antonio Spurs tonight. The win streak comes to an end, Jilly, uh, with a loss to the San Antonio Spurs, 120 to 106. And now this is the, this is the, this is like where everyone's tightening up. Like, okay, the Kings were playing well. We were feeling good. We were feeling happy. But now, okay, okay, that's good. And I think there's reason to be. However, if you're not, like if you're concerned, I totally get it because this literally happened a couple months ago. Like this literal same thing happened a couple of months ago. When the Kings had won, I think we're at seven of nine now. The same exact number it was the first time. And we know how that ended in the sense that they and they have a difficult straight. stretch coming up when you look at the schedule. Yes, it happens to be that. But don't I mean, get don't get cocky about that Lakers game either, because I think that I think I think that that's that's one that's going to be yeah. tough. And Wes Matthews, I saw, just went back to the locker room. I don't know what that's going to be like come Friday, but mm. I mean, it's it's unless you're perfect. Yes, I know the Spurs had lost six to seven, six to seven. But mm-hmm. when you play a pop team. It's hard to win two games in a row. Like that's yeah. essentially they were experienced like a playoff series, right? I mean, and they were going to have to be perfect. And it's going to be hard for the Kings to win games when your point guard and shooting guard don't show up until the second half. I mean, it's you had what 12 or 14 points from right off the bench in the first mm-hmm. half. Yeah. And then Halliburton, I think, had 13. If those guys hadn't scored, I mean, that (laughs) it would have been even uglier. I mean, they, the fact that they even kept it close for this game was progress to me because I didn't see anybody putting their heads down. It showed me that they were coming back again. Yes. They never actually got to that point where I think they maybe got within 10 or close to it. But anytime I see them not giving up and it not going to 30, 40 points, which it easily could have in previous seasons, it's showing me that there's still some fight in this team. I mean, part of the reason that I know people were upset at the moves that were made during, during the trade deadline. I know we didn't get to talk about that. I liked it because I want to keep Fox healthy. I mean, we've been putting so many minutes on that guy. And if you're someone who does want to make a run, you're going to need fresh legs. If you're someone that doesn't want to see him get really hurt, you're going to be able to need, him to he's going to have off games and you're going to need to be able to put someone in there. Um, You were going to need a backup point guard. Anyways, you got one, a good yep. one. Yeah. Um, it, it brought some more physicality to this team that was, you know, didn't have it Um, that. And, and I think he mentioned this even in, in an interview today that people were, were calling this deadline as a, all in or a tank where he was like, if I'm going all in, you're going to know I'm going all in because I will have traded for a star. Mm -hmm. These were legit what he called them value buys because they are, you know, you got your backup that you're going to need anyways next year. And you got two guys who you can essentially try out for free instead of grabbing second rounders, which we're not playing anyways. So, and if they lose the rest of the season, then the tank crowd gets what they wanted and you got a backup point guard for next year. Like it's to me, it it's it's a win-win situation. If these guys end up pushing for a playoff spot, great, because that means our core guys actually played really well to end the year. And to me, if you're gonna try and re-sign homes, sitting Fox for the rest of the season, like maybe OKC is doing to Shea, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah. where he has his injury or whatever. Good luck convincing Holmes to stay when you're not even attempting to do anything. To me, you're still trying to sell your your free agent into why he should be coming here next year and maybe taking a little bit of a pay cut. And we're probably also trying to sell other prospective 
free agents as well. Like, hey, right, you know, we're, right. we're not we're not doing the like because we've we've been through this before. We we, we did it the, the the Garrett Temple, Vince Carter, Zach Randolph year where those guys played like forty one games and the Kings shut it down like the entire second half. Now injuries kind of derailed the Kings' plan to shut everybody down the second half of the season, and that Garrett had to play. You know, Vince still didn't play a lot. Uh, uh, Zach had to play a lot right. there in that final stretch, but that wasn't the intention. The plan was to shut, for the most part, everybody completely down. Um, yeah. And, and I don't clear. think you're ever going to get Fox to be able to sit, right? Like, I don't see him ever accepting that that either, that the team coming to him and saying, yeah, do you mind sitting the rest of the season so we can try and get that top five spot? Yeah. Because to me, if he's healthy, you're not getting anything in the top three with him still playing. It's well, just not going to happen. This team isn't bad enough to be right. in the, no, no matter Even how frustrated we get. Buddy or Barnes, I don't think it would have been bad enough, right? I mean, as long as you have Fox and Halliburton there, I don't think it would have been bad enough. No, like you, you, you wouldn't have. And that's why, you know, we're here at this point. I think the, uh, I'm, I'm fine with the strategy of competing. Like I know it's frustrating that the Kings lost. Um, I, I, I know, you know, we, we, we saw the big win and we talked about this extensively today on D'Lo and Casey. It wasn't going to be the same game. Like there was no way it was going to be the same game. It's just, yeah. that's not how I think that's not how the human mind is wired. That's not how the uh, Greg Popovich teams are wired. Like you just aren't going to be able to execute it in the same exact fashion as you did uh, the last time, and we saw a stronger defensive effort, and that's really what we we thought this game would boil down to—a stronger defensive effort from San Antonio. And we talk so often, Jill, and in, in, in it's such a cliche. Oh, you know, basketball—it's it, a game of runs. It's a game of runs, and it's like no, it most yeah. definitely is. Like it's it's a game of runs for 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 sure. But the problem is, if you're the team that's down, and the Sacramento Kings were down for 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 most of this game, when you're the team that's down, to make a run, you've got to make a stop somewhere. And it felt like, particularly at the start of the third quarter, where I think De'Aaron hit a basket, Buddy hit a couple, Rashawn hit a lay-in, and it's like, okay, we here. Like, they, they're doing this. The problem was, with all of those baskets, the Spurs just walked down to the other side of the floor and scored also. Like there was no stop right. on that defensive end, and when the Kings finally started getting stops, they st- they were missing whether it was threes, they were missing shots at the rim. Like De'Aaron, De'Aaron stayed aggressive. That was one thing that I really liked yeah. about what he did tonight. Is he stayed really aggressive. He kept penetrating. He didn't settle. He drove. He drove. He drove. It's just a lot of those layups rolled off the rim, and they weren't getting any calls either. But Nothing. I felt like literally these two games flopped, right? This is what the Kings did a couple days ago and San Antonio kept trying to make those runs. And I what I think they got it to four or three at one point, And then the Kings would pull back the, yes, the Kings never got within three, mm-hmm. but you, you saw that constant back and forth and the leading team stayed, stayed leading. But like I said, I was impressed that this team did not put their head down, did not give up. I know that's small, you know, victories, but, we haven't seen, I mean, based on previous seasons, we haven't seen that. Like this team still showed some fight in them. And I appreciate that. And at any point when you're going into a season, if you can say you split with San Antonio, you're going to be happy. Yeah. Like I, this, it wasn't like we, we lost to, you know, the Pistons, like one right. and one with San Antonio. I'm happy. I'm looking at like, I I'd said on the radio, if the Kings get to 30 points from the bench, which was which like a week ago, a week and a half ago was such like a out there concept that we were going to get 30 plus points from the bench. I said, if the Kings get 30 tonight from that bench, they're going to wind up winning. They got 36 and the game wasn't even close. Like it's just, it's just one of those things, you know, they had like 30, I, I can't remember the number. I think it was 34 on Monday, 32, 34 on Monday. And it was like, dude, if that's, if that's the Kings bench, Man, we are in good shape. Uh, that just turned out right. to not and, be the case because they couldn't get any defensive stuff. And in a normal game where, you know, where you're going to have Fox hitting and Buddy mm-hmm. most likely hitting, um, Holmes hitting, like it's like they, at least like they had been, and getting that from your bench, you're going to be just fine. That's, you know, I mean, it's it just didn't work out altogether. But to me, that's promising that you're getting that from your bench when, right, how um, a, a week, Absolutely. two weeks ago, you were getting zero across the boards at times. Um, and, and this is with, what, their second, third, third game together at this mm-hmm. point? Third. Um, and, and still, 
you're still seeing Walton mix, you know, them up. And you can mm-hmm. kind of see when they drive at times, kind of looking around, trying to figure out, you know, where guys are going to be and things like that, which is understandable. Um, but the fact that they're even getting what they're getting with no practice and literally playing off the fly, I can't ask for anything more than that at, at this point from those guys. There are there are things, and I keep getting drawn over here to this comment from David on the uh, on the YouTube chat at youtube.com slash ESPN 1320. David says, as long as they come out and play hard the next game, it's all good. You know, Lakers, Bucks coming up the next couple of games. And I think that's where I think that's where Kings fans are looking at this and going, Oh man, not again. Like, let's not do this again. How are they gonna come out and play versus the Lakers? Obviously, they have that difficult game against the Bucks, and you you know, you you, you don't you you don't start you don't start checking other people's pockets here, but you've got the Timberwolves coming up. You've got the Pistons coming up. There is a game against the Utah Jazz at the end of next week as well. So you got to take advantage of the games on the schedule that you could take and advantage all, of. Right. But and all the, even the good teams, all those teams have shown to be beatable by lesser teams at some point during during the season. We show up and play your game. Show up and play your game. You have a shot. Yep. Show up and play your game. You're always going to have a shot. And and there are positives, believe it or not, it, as frustrating as the game was, and it, and it, and it was frustrating because it felt like the Kings were out of it pretty quick, but there are positives to take away. Probably not the number of attempts that you want, but again, let's not start moving the goalpost here. De'Aaron Fox was 5 of 6 from the free throw line. The Sacramento Kings as a whole were 17 of 19 from the free throw line. That's 89.5%. That's well above their season average um, turnovers 12. They're one of the best teams in the league when it comes to not turning the ball over. That's a positive. Now the negative in that was they got 19 points out of it. The San Antonio Spurs got 19 points out of those 12 turnovers. But you know, there, there are, if you, if you, if you, you know, I, it's, I guess it, it depends. Are you a, are you a glass half empty or a glass half full person? Like what is, what, what, what is this game in, in a nutshell? It's a loss to the San Antonio Spurs after you had just played San San Antonio a a couple of nights ago. All right. But because of what we saw earlier this year and what we have seen so many times with this franchise, we're sitting on the edge of our seat waiting to see what's going to happen Friday against a LeBron and AD-less Lakers. Uh, The the, the Anthony Davis-led Lakers. They got a new AD in there who's playing tonight uh, against the Milwaukee Bucks. Yeah. You know me. I'm always going to be a, a glass half full. I know you I are. Just to look at the positives. I know you are. Um, and that's and, and, and that's fine. You know, that's good. But I, to me, where being a fan of this team for so long, I've had to put myself in that mindset. Otherwise, I, I, why would I keep watching? You'd be right? miserable. And, yeah, you'd be and miserable. I wouldn't enjoy myself. I mean, it's it, what's going to happen is going to happen, and I'm and I'm not gonna going to go into the deep end and be upset over things that have not happened yet. Like mm-hmm. I I'm still trying to see every angle and every possibility of, of everything that's going on um, and, and try and find positive and, and reasons why. Am I crazy? Buddy was five of 18. I may, I may be crazy regardless of the answer to this question, Buddy was five of 18 from the field. He was four of 12. So they have 14 points. Did he score all 14 in the third quarter? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I feel like he scored all of his. That, that's yep. that is wild. He was scoreless in the first half. We know that. Uh, I I didn't think any of those points bled over. I just looked over and realized he finished with fourteen, <laughs> and I swear he had fourteen points in the in the in the third quarter. Wow. So he was scoreless for three freaking quarters. Mm-hmm. Him and Fox going into the second half were zeros. Hmm. Mm-mm, Which mm-mm. again, you're not going to win or be the fact that we were only down 16 with both of them having nothing to me showed progress. Cause at the beginning of the year, you were, you wouldn't have had that because our bench wasn't doing anything either. Yeah. Um, buddy was over for eight in the first quarter. De'Aaron was, or excuse me, the first half, Buddy was over eight and De'Aaron was all four. Mm-mm-mm. And, 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 uh, and Harrison, Harrison Barnes had six points in the first half. And he was he, two for he, eight. He, yeah. he, he, he finished with six points in the game. 14 rebounds. Dude, what Jeez. a, what a weird night, man. What a, what a, like Har- Harrison hasn't, I feel like of as, as well as, as things have gone for the Kings, 
there's like Harrison is the one guy who like in his totality haven't ha- hasn't like really found his groove. Like he hasn't found his groove with this lineup at the at the start of game. Since moving to the power yeah. forward spot. Yeah. Yeah, I th- I feel like Wait, that's the the yeah. one thing that's off. Though he's had he's had some good games, yeah. but overall, I just don't think it's he has. Which is interesting, right? Because Jason Anderson said to you on the show today that Holmes made a comment about how the game has opened up so much more for him, and yeah. he had four, 14 and fifteen, and I didn't feel like he even had that. Um, but now you're seeing Barnes right have to have to adjust, and against a bigger. Um, San Antonio team, right? Like that's uh, their guards are tall. Like that's a little bit mm-hmm. longer of a team um, where they don't really go small, uh, which I think is when Harrison usually thrives at the power four when you're going against other teams, small lineups where when you're going against Potal and um, Eubanks and you have Gay who has length, right? Um, mm-hmm. You're not, hell, what is white? Like six, five. Yeah, six, they, six. Were, um, they were they were out rebounded. Their, yeah. They were out rebounded 54 to 43. I feel like that's something that's going to happen a lot. I'm not sure that they won a points in the paint battle since moving to the starting lineup like, you know, 8 or 9 games ago yeah. wherever we're at. I'm not confident that that's something they're going to win. Though we have seen them, you know, get outscored by 40 in the paint. I think it was like 70 something to 30 something when they played the Wizards and still wind up winning the game. But I, I think that's going to be a trend. And with those trends, I think create difficulties for Harrison Barnes. I think the Lakers are yeah. going to be a really difficult matchup for them this weekend or Friday. If Harrison's having to, <laughs> having to go against that, yeah, that's mm. – um, you. I mean, Holmes is going to have his hand full with Drummond. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, that could be. This is, it's the challenge. It's the it's the ups and downs. Like there, it, it and and I don't know why. I mean, he's gonna have to go against Trez. Like I mean, just body size alone. That's that could be um, right. And then you're asking a two way right Metu to <laughs> come on, big fella. Get, you know, I mean, and I there. saw people. I saw people <laughs> trashing him today, and I'm like, now we're trashing two ways. Like oh. I get we we're all you know rooting for him, but you also have to remember he's a two way. You're a special kind of ass if you're trashing Metu. Like I mean, you're 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 on a different level if you're going after the two way guys. Like, like come on, man. Like he plays ten minutes per game, roughly. He played what what thirteen minutes tonight. Like he plays his role just fine. By the way, Metu was, was plus, plus ten, 10 he was tonight. A plus ten, yeah, <laughs> exactly. To me, he's out there doing minus the bad fouls, which I get. I mean, you know, um, he's out there doing exactly what to me what you'd expect. Him to do, let alone this guy's just coming off a ha- what four, four or five week break yeah. from being yep. on the bench yep. of getting th- thrown around. Mm-hmm. Um, Bagley yeah, gets he, hurt and he's thrown right, right out there. It is still MIA. Um, you know, I don't know if they'll ever um, go to Silva at any point. Um, maybe next game is something you try and throw his body at at Trez and help Barnes out a little bit. I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but you it's going to be interesting. I, I guess Hassan Whiteside's never playing again. This is a hell of a sore knee that Hassan Whiteside has. Well, before that, it was COVID related again. Like it's been uh, him and Jabari were out every couple weeks. It seemed like on, on COVID restrictions. Um, and then you got him back and then all of a sudden it was a knee. And prior to that, mm-hmm. it was a calf. Like, I don't, Maybe that's why he doesn't jump all year because it's just all leg. I, I don't know. Yeah, I have I no know. idea. Um, um, but you know a little bit that about point, buy him out and bring somebody else in. <laughs> that's why I was surprised they let uh, Kevin Gelly go. Like, I because I, 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 I had said on the radio that, oh, they're, they're just going to get rid of Whiteside. They're just going to get rid of Whiteside. I said it like a hundred times. Too. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, nope. Beyond has gone. But that that is all we heard leading up to it, though, was that he was going to get bought out. Well, and it, it was, didn't happen. Well, even before that, it was multiple teams are interested. The Lakers got their eyes on even, them. Right. Even when they signed him, that was kind of the implication that I got, too, that it was almost like a nod, nod, wink, wink, like we'll be playing and then you'll mm-hmm. either find me a spot, right, or yeah. you'll buy me out where I can land like every other big man has 
been able to do, um, including to market season. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't know. <sighs> the wild world of Hassan white said, he seems like a great locker. The guys seem guy. to love him. Like and they yeah, all right? say like, that they love they, him. <laughs> they don't, they don't like the guys don't seem to be frustrated by this at all. Like he seems like a great locker room guy. He was heading up the, you know, the black Falcon and the call and, and, and the, the, the celebration in the locker room and all of that silly stuff. Like he, he seems to be a legitimate, you know, locker room favorite, which, you know, there are other guys missing from the team that we've, we've speculated, you know, maybe they're not in that, that same locker room favorite category. So, uh, I, I don't know. It, it, it all, it all, as, as we've talked about it, it all boils down to Eric. I'm not saying the Kings ever said publicly, I'm saying what we heard behind <laughs> just to answer yeah. that comment <laughs> it, 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 it i think we talked about it on a podcast when he said like yeah, yeah. white side's not finishing the season here <laughs> like it, that that's a cool little that's a cool little start but white side's probably not finishing the season here I th- it, it, it's just weird especially with the with the lakers rumors you know around there even with the acquisition of andre drummond i thought they still would have uh gone after hassan Whiteside for some depth if nothing more than for some depth yeah. For the rest of the regular season, there were plenty of other whispers about who and why wanted to sign Whiteside as well. So, I mean, mm-hmm. that we've never got into. Just know that there's plenty of things that have been said behind the scenes that mm-hmm. have never been put out as usual. So, yeah. just take that for what you, you know, what you want. Yeah. Well, so what do you think happens? I mean, you're you said you're a glass half full. I mean, the Kings have still won. You know, was it seven of nine? You know, they're still playing good ball. Uh, they're still in the playoff picture. Memphis lost today. You know, I, I, obviously the San Antonio win gives them, you know, that's like a, a, a win and a half for them, just as it was a win and a half for the Sacramento Kings the other day. But uh, Memphis lost. You, you, you've you got games against the Pelicans coming up. You've got games against the Grizzlies up. You do to a certain degree. I, I don't want to say you control your destiny. Like you do, obviously you went out, you're going to make the playoffs, but like you have a lot of control over how the rest of your season goes, even, you know, with difficult matchups like the Milwaukee bucks ahead, you know, the, the, it's difficult to imagine that one going the Kings way. You've got a difficult matchup against the Utah jazz coming up a week from this coming Saturday, but you have those games against Memphis. You have those games against you know, Oklahoma City, I don't know how much it's going to matter when those guys actually play. And you're going to have games against uh, the New Orleans Pelicans. All of those teams in front of you or at least in the same position of you. You're going to have a chance to right. beat them. And what the Kings had either the hardest or the second hardest schedule um, in the first half of the season. Right. And and they had their ups and downs. You had your big one streaks and then you had your really long losing streak. Where now if we if we would have just been able to cut that in half. Um, we'd be in a totally different position right now. Uh, the second half of the season, we're, I think it's the 14th. It, it's in the Kings' hands again. Mm-hmm. It, if this starting lineup right now, their numbers, they're the three or fourth best lineup in the NBA currently right now, our, our current starting lineup. If those guys continue to do what they've been doing, mm-hmm. they'll be fine. It'll happen. It, it's it's in their hands. Well, if we can get a night where, you know, that starting lineup does the thing that they, they, they do, you know, Harrison Barnes, obviously this was an off night for him. It was a terrible night for Buddy Heald, who only scored in one quarter. He just kind of scored a lot in that one. Uh, not the night from De'Aaron Fox that we've seen over, you know, the last month and a half or whatever it's been. But when those guys are kind of in a normal flow, like I felt like DeLon Wright was going to snap out of that. The only thing that DeLon Wright really hadn't done since he had become a king is is hit hit a couple of shots. I felt like he was really active in the first San Antonio Spurs game uh, on, on Monday. Like he didn't score. And if he did, he I did everything he didn't, else, though. Yeah, I think he had it, two. OK, I was going to say if he if, if he scored, he didn't score very much, but he was he was active on the boards. He was he was getting assists. like it wasn't a game that you go, oh, what did DeLon Wright play? Like you knew he was out there. You saw him out there. You saw him active. If you get him in a rhythm where now, you know, he's his his shot is falling in addition to all of those other things that he's doing. It's a it's a good place. Again, we talk about the depth of this team. It's right. going to help them, you know, moving forward. I think this was a tough game for them, no matter what you think of San Antonio, no matter San, San Antonio struggles. This was going to yeah. be a tough game for them. And as as we've noted already, 
Yeah, and with where, Wright, he's he's having to come. He'd been he started on the bench in Detroit, and then when Hayes went down, he had been starting for most of the season. Right yeah. now, he's having to relearn to the bench. And when he's playing with Fox, you can see that he defers to Fox a lot. Um, when Fox wasn't hitting it today, you did see him right start to take over and take more shots. Where last game, Fox was hitting everything, so it was like, yep. I, mm -hmm. I'm going to keep going and give it to you. So it was nice to see a point guard realize who had the hot hand. He even gave it to Buddy at one point after Buddy hit like two or three threes yeah. in a row yeah. and you saw it. So it was nice to see where we've lacked that sometimes too, where guys lack the recognition of who's hot. And you know, you'll see a guy make like three or four baskets in a row and it's like, why did you stop going to him? Mm -hmm. We did yeah. see that today where they at least kept going. Um, to the hot hand. So that was nice to see from, from a bench role as well with that. Yeah, for sure. Ramsey's uh, letting us know here on youtube.com slash ESPN 1323 games against Dallas and Oklahoma city two against Memphis. And I think those are at the very, very end of the season. There's still one against San Antonio, uh, new Orleans on the way and another one against golden state. So all teams in front of you, the opportunities are there. They're, they're there for the Sacramento Kings. And certainly, you know, those, those games against the Lakers matter, you know, the games against the bucks and, and the jazz and those really, really tough teams. Like they, they, they're, they're going to play a factor into all of this. So. Um, yeah. Buckle up, grab some alcohol, grab a drink, pour a drink, pour some wine, pour some McQueen in the violet fog. And uh, let's see where this thing takes yeah. us. Cause it's going to be an interesting Friday and Saturday. That's for sure. Yep. And, and I still think that this is very much a, um, you know, since we didn't get to talk about this last week, um, Monty as a, you know, people were questioning moves and non moves, but I still think it's very, still very much an evaluation year. Right. And mm -hmm. to me, this, this next, what is it? 18, 19 games left. Um, it's going to prove a lot to your new right GM. Your co if you want your coach to stay, you're you're going to have to prove why you want your coach to stay. Right? We keep hearing how loyal these players are to Luke and things like that. At some point, you have to stop saying "give me the smoke" and prove that you can handle the smoke. And that if you're asking a GM or coaches for for trust and things like that, at some point you're going to have to prove that that you've earned it, especially to a new GM. Um, I know a lot of people were crediting Houston, I mean, uh, Orlando for finally, you know, throwing in the towel, but I keep saying it took that GM and front office three seasons to watch what they watched before they finally threw in the towel. Just because we got a new GM and half a year and the Kings are still kind of at the bottom, doesn't mean that he's ready to go one road or the other. Sometimes they yeah. still have to see for themselves before they you know, make an all in or, you know, what kind of decision they're going to make that he's literally seen six months of not even six months of, of, of basketball from these guys that um, to make any kind of rash decisions right now, I, I just don't think was really gonna, gonna happen. It's going to be interesting to uh, just kind of watch some of this unfold. You know, we, we, we criticized, we've criticized the reaction of the organization and this was obviously a previous regime, but there was always a belief that players didn't like Luke Walton or excuse me, players didn't like Dave Yeager. And that was part yes. of the reason that Dave Yeager was shown the door. Um, despite the, uh, the groundbreaking 39 win season that that Sacramento Kings team had. And so now it's kind of a different perspective where, you know, you reference the loyalty that the, you know, the players have to Luke Walton and, specifically De'Aaron De Fox, as Ramona Shelburne told us on ESPN 1320 this week. And it's like, okay, how much of a factor is that going to play? Obviously, with De'Aaron, it holds a lot of weight. But with Buddy, it probably doesn't. Like, if Buddy loves Luke Walton, and <laughs> I know there's probably some jokes to be made there, that, that shouldn't hold any weight. Harrison Barnes, maybe it does. De'Aaron, obviously it does, but how much... Can Monty McNair really take that into consideration if he decides at the end of the season, however this season winds up ending, he's got to move on from Luke Walton. You know what I mean? That's it. That's it. Yeah. We, we, I we think out of anyone, Fox is going to have right the voice out of anybody. That's that's your your star, right? And there, I think there still is a fine line where even though they're not winning, 
you're going to ask for, I think you're still going to ask for feedback from that guy, whether you follow through with whatever he says, but I wouldn't be shocked him actually, you know, asking for his, his input. I mean, sure. Oh no, of course, of course yeah. you, you, you absolutely ask for his input, but you also, but whether he takes it for that. And it, that, and that's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. How do you, how do you communicate to him? Like, Hey, and and again, the, the, this is just talking about. This is just kind of laying out one specific scenario that yeah. could happen. Like, you know, we we're we we think we need to move on from him. Here's what we're looking right. at, and which I think with any team, right? You're it's if you want to if you want to keep playing with these players, if you want to keep playing with this this coach or coaching staff, at some point you got to prove that it's working, right? Yeah. Or that you're right. you're showing steps. And if it's not, then. It, it is what it is. Yeah. Well, well, they're 22 and 26 right now. And and I was looking at their, you know, their record earlier today before this game when they were 22 and 25, just thinking that really is incredible given the fact that, you know, they were at 17 wins. It, it, it feels like a week ago and it just felt like the season was just going straight to hell. And it was, yeah. it, it was going straight to basketball hell uh, as Kings fans are so familiar with. So uh, all attention now, Turns to uh, a tough weekend uh, with the Los Angeles Lakers and the Bucks coming up on Saturday. The fact they had a nine-game losing streak and they're twenty-two and twenty-six blows my mind. <laughs> like that. <laughs> That's because the nine-game losing streak came after uh, a seven of nine stretch that the Kings yeah. won, which is where we're at now—a seven of nine stretch. <laughs> By the way, oh, this is terrible. They were heading into a Friday night game. If I recall, it was against Orlando when De'Aaron missed the game last minute, when uh, Marvin Bagley missed the game last minute. So what do we got now? We got a seven of nine stretch headed into a Friday night game. This one against uh, Andre Drummond and the Los Angeles Lakers. So uh, we appreciate y'all for tuning in. We appreciate those who've watched here on twitch.tv slash ESPN 1320 and the ESPN 1320 YouTube channel. Make sure that you subscribe there, follow there, do all of that great stuff. Make sure you check out the Hoopball podcast and all of the Hoopball podcasts. Just search Hoopball on your favorite podcast platform. Your favorite team will come up, hit the subscribe button, uh, hit the rating button too. hit the five star rating if you're watching there or if you're listening there on Apple Podcasts. We greatly appreciate it. She is Jill Edge. That's at Jill Edge on Twitter. I'm Damian Barling. We'll see you next time here on the Sacramento Kings podcast presented by Hoopball and the Hoopball Podcast Network.